like Benjamin, I wanted to start with a quick question, um, just to know if there's any of you that were in the audience in 2015 when Pete Masters presented the, the new Missing Maps project. No, a few, a few people. <laughs> um, and who, who in the audience has heard of Missing Maps? Okay, that's looking a bit better. <laughs> um, so I'm here to talk to you about a qualitative review we conducted about Missing Maps and what happened next. Um, and as a brief bit of background, for those of you that are less familiar with the project, um, basically a lack of accurate and up-to-date maps was identified as a challenge for MSF teams working in the field. Missing Maps was then created in 2014 in response to this need with the aim of putting the most vulnerable people on the map. So to give you a very quick practical example, I came back this week from Zemio in the southeast of the Central African Republic. If you look at Zemio on Google Maps, this is what you get. Basically, very, very little. So the team in Zemio, to fill this gap, had been working with this, a map developed by a budding local cartographer. Um, then Instep Missing Maps, um, a few years ago, and mapped remotely uh, Zemio using satellite imagery. So then if you go to OpenStreetMaps, you get this. You can see there, I mean, the, without zooming in, but there's a lot of nice detail in terms of down to household level, pathways, basic facilities, airstrips, etc. So... Um, Missing Maps has three main strands of work to do these tasks. The first one being remote mapping, which is where groups of volunteer mappers gather in mapathons usually and map um, satellite imagery into OpenStreetMaps. The second is field mapping, where um, Missing Maps team members are deployed to conduct mapping on the ground, often it, with collaboration with local mapping communities. And the third is integrated field mapping, which is a combined approach, again, involving the deployment of Missing Maps team members to train and support local NGO staff and MSF staff to conduct mapping on the ground themselves. So, up to now, there's basically many um, metrics that could deem this project to be a success, some numbers. So, there's been over 25,000 contributors who've made over 28 million edits and put over 320,000 buildings and over 1 million kilometers of road on the map. Sounds pretty good. But the question still remained, has this really added value for MSF's activities in the field? So this review was agreed with the primary objective of documenting the added value of missing maps for MSF in the field. And then, uh, very broadly, um, with the aim of also looking at what worked, what didn't work, um, in order to inform the future strategy and direction of missing maps and ongoing setting up ongoing monitoring and evaluation. Okay. Um, on methods, basically this involved uh, documenting missing maps activities to date, and then an in-depth qualitative review um, of six activities through 17 in-depth interviews. Here, just very briefly, is an overview of the activities um, and the participants, basically including a wide range of participants from different levels within MSF, um, different positions, and both national and international staff. Um, on the overview, um, 42 mapping activities were documented over 14 countries. It's interesting to note here that this represents very roughly a third of missing maps activities, the others being com commissioned or requested through other organisations like the Red Cross. The most mapped countries were DRC, Sierra Leone and South Sudan. And the majority of mapping was preemptive, so around 69%, which meant that it was requested um, the mapping of an area that was identified as potentially vulnerable to outbreaks in the future. Um, where, and then 31% of the requests were specific, specific were for reactive mapping, so responding to a specific operational need. Um, and then just briefly on the graph, you can see again that the, the most requests were for general base maps, so satellite maps for um, general preemptive purposes. So from this, um, three, oh, forgive me, 
I lost one. Yeah, sorry. Um, three clear levels of use emerged. The first being um, basically a map as a map, just having a map for orientation purposes and to know the area MSF is working in. The second was you having a map in support of a specific punctual intervention. So your surveys, your assessments, um, your vaccination campaigns, for example, and particularly used as ways of calculating population estimates and um, supporting sample size calculations for epidemiological surveys. And the last was for ongoing surveillance and decision making when the maps were integrated with medical data analysis. Um, so, in terms of results, what was the added value? Um, so, starting from a field perspective, for the participants, a very clear added value was improved orientation. As I said, knowing, just knowing the area. Um, and participants also described that without maps, that they often felt blind, which had detrimental uh, effects on the activities in the field. Um, secondly, the maps contributed to more target, targeted, accurate and efficient activities. So the surveys and the assess assessments, for example, were seen to be more robust and more rigorous by the participants. Also, they noted that MSF team members saved time because they didn't have to worry about um, mapping or, or calculating the population sizes manually, for example. It was also highly value valued when um, maps enabled the contextualization and visualization of medical data. This was particularly when maps were combined with GIS technology or custom-made ad hoc tools that were developed in the missions, even using Excel, for example, of ways to combine medical and geographical data. Um, then at more at an organizational level, many of the participants felt that missing maps added a value in the way that it engaged with civil society and harnessed volunteer capacity. This was felt to be something a bit new for MSF and also reflect the great potential um, crowdsourcing or co-production has for the organisation in the future. It was also seen to contribute to the global mapping agenda, so facilitating potentially the work of other organisations and also some participants felt just um, supporting the basic human right of people to be on the map. Um, here, there's one quote from one of our participants talking about vaccination coverage. So we can produce a map of vaccination coverage and we can see that this area has been covered well and there is a gap here. If we have the geographical data, we can say, yes, okay, here we have an area where we do vaccination, but here it's totally forgotten. So then we can adapt the strategy and implement some vaccination in that area. So in this way, it was seen to be influencing the organisation of activities like this. Um, secondly, in terms of the results, what made it work? Again, starting at field level, um, clearly people in the field with the capacity and motivation to map and to champion mapping were critical. And it was interesting here that the very organic way that mapping and missing maps use had grown within MSF as people moved between missions and taking with them their expertise and encouraging others to map. Um, secondly, base maps were appreciated, but m mapping was much more valued when it was combined with either field mapping, so qualitative data collected in the field, such as water points, scores, health centres, for example, or when it was combined with ways of visualising medical data like GIS. A lot of examples of that are outside. Um, and lastly, mapping was optimised when it was a team effort. So when it was really inter interdisciplinary within the field teams, including logistics, health promotion, outreach, epidemiologists, and also when it involved collaboration with the local community, which was perceived to contribute to the accuracy and relevance of the maps, and was also by some participants seen as a, a useful uh, activity in itself as a way to engage with um, local community and build relationships. Um, then from the missing maps perspective, um, participants really valued the quick and responsive support provided by the coordination and the positive relationship um, and the openness to finding dynamic and creative solutions to specific field needs. 
Lastly, just simply producing a high quality product and using simple technology was appreciated by participants. Um, and another quote here, um, describing, yeah, using the maps combined with GIS technology. So whatever line list or database you have of an outbreak or disease, it will pick out your household or your row or your block or your village and just create lots of dots on the map. Then you can see immediately where cases are clustering and you can create movies so you can see it over time, where the disease is spreading to, whether it's spreading uniformly everywhere or whether it's really clustering in one corner of the camp. Then you can immediately say, well, the problem's over there. It just helps us to investigate and hone in on where the issues might be. Lastly, the interesting bit, <laughs> the, what were the challenges? Um, again, with, at field level, um, one of the main challenges was that it was, it was very clear that there was a real lack of knowledge and awareness of missing maps and the options available. Um, even people who'd been involved in mapping activities weren't necessarily aware of the different services or the different uses of mapping products. And for many participants, there was a general air of mystery about missing maps. Was it MSF? Is it not MSF? What, who do you contact? These kind of things were, were often very unclear to people. Um, also, how to meaningfully integrate medical data with maps. So to go from a map as a map to really using it as a tool for decision making was for some challenging. Um, and also how to use maps sustainably. Again, this was seen as um, a, a, another victim potentially of international staff turnover in the field. Um, and some national staff involved mentioned that they were collecting a lot of data in the field but didn't see products of this work. Um, then at a more organizational and missing maths level, the main challenges were um, unclear responsibilities, communication channels and structure for some people, it was unclear how missing maps fitted within MSF, and particularly how it fitted with the work of the GIS unit based in Geneva. Um, it was also linked to the communication needs of working with volunteers. For example, a lot of social media um, communication needed for that was sometimes problematic in the more sensitive areas where MSF is working. Um, lastly, a lack of operational buy-in was also stated by some participants as a barrier. Many reasons were given to this, given for this. For example, MSF is an emergency organisation. Why are we doing preemptive mapping? We've made it this far without <coughs> missing maps. Do we really need to add another layer of complexity and technology to our operations? And this culture of missing maps, very um, crowd-sourced, um, social media heavy, is this... MSF culture? Does it fit with the MSF culture? Um, again, just focusing on the quote on the right, uh, as one participant mentioned, okay, missing maps is more about preemptive mapping. Convincing operations sometimes can be tricky because they don't see the added value, because it's not the MSF culture to have that kind of analysis. Ultimately, it's hard to change the way people take decisions. So, to sum up, um, this review suggests that um, Missing Maps has had va a great value in terms of quality, focus, and efficiency of MSF activities in the field. As one participant summed up, without Missing Maps, MSF would still do its job well. The doctor would still be a doctor, but it's improved for sure. Um, here, looking at Missing Maps through the lens of innovation gives some interesting reflections on um, the, the status of the project now. The success factors and challenges that I mentioned, rather than being particular to missing maps, are in a way characteristic of a lot of innovative initiatives and their stage in the innovation process. This is particularly linked to what's been referred to as innovation's missing middle, where humanitarian organisations pilot new initiatives but are unsure when to call it a success or a failure if to scale it up, how to scale it up. It's also linked to the humanitarian space for innovation and our organizational cultures. Running a large and sorry, sorry, running a large and complex organization like MSF, <laughs> forgive me. <laughs> I jumped one last <laughs> It's coming, <laughs> forgive me. It's uh, a slip. Um, running a large and complex organization like MSF requires structure, standardization, 
and bureaucracy to a degree, um, and um, risk management. Change can be slow, particularly when it's linked to how we manage data and how we make decisions. And a rollout of a new initiative can be heavy. Is MSF ready for these changes? And how does MSF decide when to make these changes with a new project? To sum up, um, basically, it's clear that decisions around missing maps and a strategy are needed. To optimize the added value, it's clear that roles, relationships, and structure need to be clarified. Visibility needs to be increased, um, including adequate resources and establishing ongoing monitoring. Um, very briefly on limitations, it's clear that a challenge with this, that there was no baseline data nor any indicators of success to measure against for this review. It's qualitative, so the results aren't general, generalizable. Um, and in some of the activities we reviewed, GIS was also involved, so delineating between the added value of missing maps and GIS is, is hard to draw, but it's clear the two combined was very powerful. And thank you very much to all who participated, and uh, thank you for listening.